my passion is uh, family relationships, marriage relationships, uh, relationships within the family, whether it's the siblings or the parents. So this piece is kind of near and dear uh, for me. And what I want you to do is to start out by thinking about the broader cultural ethos. Whether you realize it or not, there are beliefs that just kind of hang in the air in American culture. Now granted, they're different depending on the specific culture that you're speaking about, but we've got some pretty generic ones that are overreaching, right? Cultural ethos. I'll give you an example of one. Most of the people in our culture, and our culture is not alone in this belief, believe in the value of hard work. It's just in there, right? I mean, you, you, you don't even think about it. You take it for granted that that's just the way things should be, right? I mean, when I, I uh, did some time uh, counseling uh, active duty military overseas, and I remember being in Germany when they were on holiday uh, during a, a particular uh, summer. And when I mean by holiday, everything closes down for a month in the country, right? And people go on holiday. Can you imagine that ever happening here? <laughs> Never. I fantasize about it, <laughs> but I don't think that will happen. It's, there's a different sense about what work is supposed to be in that uh, European uh, context. It's different here. Uh, people here, we have to pull them away. I know uh, colleagues of mine, you get a certain amount of vacation time every year and they don't even use it all, you know, in terms of the, what I feel is the rejuvenating effect of being able to pull away from work. But it's in the cultural ethos. Okay, and I'm gonna throw out another one on you. This one is really, really cool. Happiness. It's in the Constitution, right? We're supposed to be free to what? Pursue happiness. happiness. I don't remember exactly how it's worded, but it's in there. You can pull it up. I'm here to tell you, and it'll be interesting to watch the reactions, I don't believe in happiness. Is that anti-American? Am I un-American? No, I'm not un-American. Why would I say I don't, and it's a rhetorical question, why would I say I don't believe in happiness? What's the definition of happiness? We even have our fairy tales. What do our fairy tales say at the very end? And they live happily ever after. I'm creating angst just looking at you guys. There's an angst. What do parents say to their teenagers when their teenagers are giving them all sorts of grief and they want to make various decisions and the parents are trying to give them space be able to do what they need to do. Well, what do those parents say? Whatever makes you happy. I just want you to be happy. That's a lot of pressure. I think that's a lot of pressure. But here's the deal. Happiness is not a state or condition of being. It's momentary. It's fleeting. Now, if you're fortunate enough to string together one moment after another of happy experiences, maybe, just maybe, you could be happy. But I'm here to tell you that does not happen often. Not as often as the fairy tale would say, and they lived happily ever after, which means a state or condition, right? So the first point here that I want to make with you is you got this cultural ethos telling you, you 
will be happy. And you should strive for happiness. It's in our DNA, our American DNA. I don't know. I don't know about the Germans and the Brits and some of the other places I've been. They don't seem to focus on it quite the way we do. At least that's been my anecdotal perspective. So you've got to be thinking, I've been doing this counseling bit, working with couples in particular for 40 years now. I have seen a lot of stuff in 40 years. I've seen a lot of things come and go over that period in terms of the way people come in and they present. So to present this, this notion of realistic expectations or unrealistic expectations that people have about marriage and family life, and this really fits into the work-family balance that most people are trying to come up with. We've got to create another context. So in the early 90s, uh, my wife and I decided to build a house. And uh, it was actually my brother-in-law. I'm going to give him some credit here. My wife's brother-in-law. There was a contractor. And he said, uh, uh, Tom, let me build a house for you. And so after a long conversation with my wife, we decided, you know, sometimes with family you have to be careful, but in this instance it seemed like the risk was was worth it, and it really turned out very well. But he sat us down when we agreed to go ahead and do it. And he sat us down, and he said, nah, we got to have a conversation right at the get-go. And uh, went something like this. He said, um, when you build a house, there are three factors that you have to take into consideration when you're building a home. Cost, speed, and quality. Tell me which two you would like. You cannot have all three. Which two would you like? And I can still remember sitting there on the couch, my wife and I, as he's explaining this to me, having an immediate reaction, you know, what do you mean I can't have all three? You know, I want to keep it within budget or have it be reasonable. I want it done in the right kind of time frame, and I want good quality workmanship. You know, it's kind of like that old Burger King thing about uh, you want it your way, right? I want my burger my way. I want my house my way. He says, well, you can't. He says, resources are finite. There's only so much to go around, whether it's the money or the workers, um, uh, and, and even the timeline. There's, there's only so much to go around. So you tell me what two you want. Well, you can imagine we're thinking about the scenario, and it didn't take us long to arrive at the fact that we wanted to keep it in budget and good quality workmanship. And he said, okay, you're the last on my list in terms of priority. He says that doesn't mean that we're not going to get it done. But it's possible that it might be delayed, and you could end up getting in maybe a month or two or three later than what you had hoped. And doggone it, it was almost um, uh, prophetic, because we ended up, um, I, I can still remember creating this romantic dinner in the middle of the house. It's not done. We were hoping to be in by Christmas, and the place is still being built. And um, you know, I got my Johnny Mathis Christmas music and a bottle of wine and, and some gourmet pizza and I had my wife come over and then we went to the movies and it was a bad blizzard and we were the only people in the movie which actually made it more romantic. But there we were, the house was not done. It was supposed to be done by uh, Christmas time. It ended up we got in late March, about three months later. I can remember thinking about this conversation afterwards, I could not get it out of my head. And you're going to say to me, why? why? Why would this be so stuck? I, I kept thinking about my clients. 
and the kinds of things my clients were saying to me about the reasons that they were unhappy. <gasps> Ooh, there's that happy word. They came in in marital distress, right? Things aren't going the way that they would like them to. And, uh, and there are actually a number of these expectations. I'm going to reframe it a little bit, kind of like that cultural ethos, that says that there are ideals that most people have about marriage and family life. And they're unspoken. We don't necessarily talk about it, but when we come in in marital distress, it's because those things are not working the way that we think they should be. So about 25 years ago, I started hearing a phrase. Maybe it goes back further than that. I actually spent some time trying to see if there was anybody in the literature that referenced it um, and actually identified it as something we were hearing in these um, marital sessions. I couldn't come up with anybody. Um, but the phrase is, a couple comes in, they sit down, and one partner makes an announcement to the other partner. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. That's a really interesting statement. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Interesting that you can compartmentalize about that way, but I started to hear this over and over and over again, given the distress uh, that people were in. And you know, marriages are, they're, they're tough. It's tough to make that commitment last in our culture. We're a transient culture. Culture's always moving. Um, people are moving. Jobs have to take priority sometimes. Um, the demands in terms of taking on kids, we'll be talking about some of that. The divorce rate is not what it was, but people also weren't marrying. Um, and in fact, we could talk about, uh, used to be, you know, I would have people that I might have worked with uh, that have been married three times, four times, five times. Actually, here's a session I had with a couple who came in. This is a true story. One had been married five times, the other one six times. They came in for the initial session, and they stood like this, looking at each other, hands clenched. And I'm a pretty charming fella, if you haven't figured it out. Uh, I usually can get people to cooperate with me, do what I need them to do to try to make things happen in that therapy room. And so they're standing there just like this. And I let it go by for a minute or two, thinking one or the other of them are going to, to sit down. But they did not. And so I would, would say, well, you know, so-and-so, how about if you have a seat here, or come on up, have a seat there. It was as if I wasn't even in the room, right? Another few minutes go by, and the woman just turns and walks out. And the guy reaches in his pocket, the check for the session was in his pocket. He reaches out and he throws it, and it kind of does that little thing, you know, floating down to the um, coffee table. And he walks out. It's the only time I'd ever seen him. Never seen him again. It was the easiest money I ever made for 10 minutes, <laughs> although it kind of left me very unsettled. But they had been married so many times that when they encounter um, disagreements or conflict, they move very quickly to the relationship being threatened, um, that, that it was over. And I, I don't know if they ended up finding another therapist or stayed together. I'm going to assume that they probably didn't, but, uh, but you never know. Uh, but that's, that's a, a good indicator. But we don't have people even marrying. People will marry the first time, and it's like, okay, I got a mulligan here, I'm gonna do it again, right? This one didn't work out, so, and maybe 
the circumstances, I wasn't as mature as I should be, or she wasn't as mature as she should, whatever. It didn't work out. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna improve here in this second relationship. Second relationship actually has a higher divorce rate than the first one. And it actually goes up the divorce rate with each of those in terms of averaging them out. But now we don't even have people. After the second marriage, people do not remarry. They cohabit. And um, uh, so you've, you've got the you know, marriage kind of broadly being impacted. Um, and then given the age that people are marrying, you, know, you got that whole thing too in terms of waiting. Uh, for what is considered the right time and the concern that some of the younger generation has about not wanting to settle. Um, and I'm here to tell you there is no such thing as a, no, no, I shouldn't frame it that way. There is such a thing as a soulmate, but by the time you find him or her, you'll be dead. <laughs> They're out there, but the great majority of us can't find them. So if you're gonna wait, which a lot of people are doing. You know, I don't want to settle for something that's just not the, the best. Um, we don't commit. And, uh, and then so when it's a papinage, you got uh, kind of that serial monogamy thing going on uh, with some folk. Um, all right, so you've got this, this uh, cultural ethos around happiness. You've got these ideals. And, and these, this contractor's model that I've spoken to you about, I've kind of adapted it and made it my own. Based on the ideals of things that I've heard in my practice over the years. And I think these will resonate with, uh, uh, with you. Rarely do I hear people uh, say something that doesn't fit quite like this. Um, when I get married, I want to have, and this is my frame, uh, I want some hot romance and I want an abiding friendship. Hot romance, I've included everything there. It's that special kind of feeling that you have relative to this person. Um, you know, it can include the love making, the, the whoopee, and just being together as a, as a couple, right? So the description that I gave you, my wife and I in the, you know, in the house that we're building together, our dream home, you know, and I'm trying to create this, uh, uh, this moment, if you will. That's based on that notion of hot romance. Right? Abiding friendship is the ideal, similar to hot romance, but in this instance, it's relative to intimacy, conversational intimacy. I don't hear many people um, talking about choosing a partner just based on the hot romance. I, I, I will hear, and the guys will say the same thing, I want to be able to talk to her. I want to be able to talk to him. And the part of this comes out of what I've heard from people, kind of just like I said about the I love you but I'm not in love with you, right? People will say, you never talk to me. I feel like I don't ever know what you're thinking or you're feeling. I, f I feel like we're just ships that pass in the night here. Um, so if you do the flip side, it's that expectation that there's going to be a friendship component. Well, it doesn't end there. Um, you've got this notion of great parenting as an ideal. And I'm here to tell you, I rarely I've never had a, a family come in, even um, unhealthy, really unhealthy families where the people didn't want to be good parents, great parents. They want to do right by their kids. I want to give my kid a better start than I had. You'll hear them say those kinds of things as an ideal. Right? Finally, we've got successful career. Successful career is broadly defined. It's making some sort of contribution. Um, it can be drawing a paycheck, but it also can include uh, those people that might be a caregiver, uh, that may be a stay-at-home mom or dad, uh, that have made some conscious choices that way 
uh, and people want to contribute. They want to feel like they're a, you know, competent and masterful in terms of making this contribution. So I, I was not as good as the contractor to break it down to three ideas, right? And the way we're going to play with this is different than the contractor's model also, where his point was uh, you can only have two of these three. This, I'm going to frame it a little different with these ideals. The way that I would like you to think about this is you can only ever realize two of these ideals in any one moment in time. Try that on for some. That's why I say you can't have it all. You are finite. There are limits to who you are. You, are. you have limits similar to the contractor's model with regards to resources. You have limits in terms of the way that you can uh, provide care to the people that you care about. Uh, you have limits to being able to always be on when it comes to your job or your work. But those are ideals similar to the work ethic that we talked about that's just in that cultural ethos that most people strive for and they drive and they push themselves. So let's play with this uh, another way. So we got uh, Johnny and Susie. Johnny and Susie, uh, they got that hot romance, they got the abiding friendship, and they decide to commit. And lo and behold, in a couple of years, they decide that they're gonna start a family. Right? And we'll even leave the successful career out of it just for a moment, maybe make it an easier parallel. So uh, they have this little kid, as Popeye would say, little infant, Right? Remember Popeye? No, nobody. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. We were big Popeye fans here. Um, so they had this baby, and if we were to think about this, they had the heart romance, the abiding friendship. Now they're taking on, they're taking on this new role as parents, and they take it on with a passion. Right? What's the first thing to go when you do those? If you just look at those three. I have yet to have anybody tell me anything different. It makes perfect sense because as you take on the role of a parent, you're sleep deprived. You're trying to figure out this new role. It requires a tremendous amount of concentration and effort. Well, why isn't the abiding friendship that suffers and the hot romance is still there? Why, why, is it, why is it that the hot romance is gone? You're not having conversations about the kid. You're having conversations about the kid. You're talking about who's getting up at that midnight feeding, right? Working out the logistics. You're trying to figure out how we're going to do this thing. It's, I remember that first year when our, uh, the, the first child came along just feeling surreal. There was a surrealness to it trying to stay on top of everything and, and you know, learn what we needed to learn to be a good mom and dad, right? But the hot romance. Now, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. If the hot romance begins to lose its fire, does that mean it's out? So when the person comes in and they say, I love you, but I'm not in love with you, should as a therapist we go, okay, well, I'll do some post-divorce adjustment counseling. No? I was just thinking about the phrase, I'm not, I, I, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. To me, to say I'm in love means I'm in this. So it's like two, it takes two people to, to be in something together. And so it's to be in love, then you have to be in it. You know, and, and so to me the phrase, if it would, I would work with someone's language and just say, well, listen to what you're saying. You love them, but you're not in love. It's because you, you stepped out. You stepped back in. Yeah, I, 
the other piece of that, when they say, what is it that you think they love? They love the history. That you've created some, even in the toughest relationships, you've created some good memories. They're, you've birthed children together. And you, you've raised these little hellions together. You know, you, you've really uh, tried to do your best uh, as it relates to creating this family life. And, and there's a certain appreciation uh, that's there. So when people say, I love you, but I'm not in love with you, part of what they do love is that notion of history. I will highlight that as an important piece. Um, but I agree with you, the, the notion of in, meaning I'm not so sure that they mean that they're not in, but they're thinking that maybe they don't want to be in, right? The, the point here with these um, ideals is most people will have some version of those included, but they don't necessarily think realistically about how that's going to play out. Uh, Tim's comment uh, about uh, find uh, uh, somebody that might be able to watch the kids so you can get out and be together just as a couple, that's an actual great uh, solution. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't always play out that way because you know how it is. You know, lots of times you can make grand plans and kid breaks his arm or you know, somebody's got a flat tire or um, you know somebody has given the babysitter a rough time and you got to come back early, right? There's there's always something in the mix that can impact it. But the notion of the ideal when when people are looking for that happiness, it's, it's your job to make me happy. I think that we've seen a real change in the way we define um, how the marriage contract is supposed to play out. It used to be, you know, we're going to work together, we're going to partner together, create a life together, provide for each other, uh, pay our bills, take care of our kids. If you had relationship intimacy, conversational intimacy, it was almost like a bonus, uh, separate and apart from uh, uh, you know, some sort of hot romance. Today, given the affluence of the culture, and I say that relatively because there's still uh, uh, lots of folks that are struggling, uh, but it is a much more affluent uh, population that we have. It's not about those things anymore. It's about emotional nourishment, that I'm expecting you to care for me in a particular way that advances my sense of well-being, uh, which actually even makes it that much tougher. I mean, if you look at, go back and read Margaret Mead's Male and Female. This book is from 1948, and it's still, to read it, uh, it's, to me, it's just so alive. And a lot of people have used it to create various theories. Nancy Chodoro uh, used it to, to create her um, model on the reproduction of mothering. Was one of the early feminist uh, theorists. Um, but Margaret Mead said, no two homes in America speak the same language. That's a really, that's a profound statement. Given that we're the big melting pot, um, the argument is the nuances that she found in those Samoan tribes, right, where when people stood a certain way, it meant the same thing from person to person to person to person. Well, that's not the case in, in our culture. I'll give you an example. My wife and I are uh, newly married, um, and I'm working on my master's degree, finishing up a master's degree, and I'm studying. and. Um, and when I'm really struggling with understanding some concepts and I'm, I'm in the book, I, my brow will naturally furrow. And she comes up to me and says, are you mad at me? I'm like, oh, no, babe, I'm not mad. I'm, I'm just studying. I'm reading. I'm just looking at this stuff, you know. Goes away, comes back. I'm, you're mad at me, huh? I know you're mad at me. No, babe, I'm not mad at you. I'm just studying. I'm deep in thought. Third time, comes back. 
are you mad at me? I'm getting mad now. <laughs> but she, the nuances, those nuances are different based on your particular family. You end up having to hammer out a new language, especially as it relates to nonverbal cues, that is never perfectly understood, which works against the kind of conversational intimacy that we're talking about as an ideal. So you've got that challenge that's also a part of the mix. So when I say you can only have two of these, you can only realize two of these at any one moment in time, what thoughts do you have about that? I took a woman in leadership seminar last semester, and one of the best quotes was that you can have it all, you just can't have it all at the same time. And I think it relates exactly to what you're saying. You can have a career, but you may not be able to have it at the same time as your parenting. You can have a romance, but maybe not as have to pick and choose which ones you want when and how that works out. Well, you really, you really hit the nail on the head. The idea here, and this is how most people make their decisions, is I want it all now. And when I've presented this in, in other settings, I will occasionally get people who will say to me, I don't agree with you, uh, Dr. Matta. I feel like my parents had it all. Or I've seen uh, people in my uh, social network and they have it all. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give you that maybe a few folks have it, but the great majority of us have limited availability. And we are stretched to try to realize these ideals that we're going after, we're serious about realizing these things and, and mastering them, being good at them. We want to be a good husband or, or wife. We want to be a good parent. We want to make a contribution in terms of, of that career. Um, but it is, it is important to take a longer term perspective. And, and I do agree with your statement. You can have it all, but it's over your lifetime. It's not... Uh, at any particular moment because now in the instance where we do have the the hot romance kind of waning um, you've got to put that back on the what we call the front burner make it more of a priority right and let something else move to less of a priority even if it's only just for those moments and so you end up kind of doing this juggling act moving uh, or you'll hear people talk about plates. I got all these plates spinning, you know, to describe that process. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you just have to go without any hot romance until the kids grow up. Although the typical middle agers, once the kids are grown, they rediscover themselves. There's a small portion that actually divorce because the relationship's been devitalized. But um, uh, the typical scenario, and I think uh, the sand truck text talks about it that way, is that the middle-aged folks begin to rediscover each other because they have time to do it. Well, I've heard, I've heard some people say that we should get away from thinking of a model that has us with a lifetime partner, that we need a different partner for different portions of our life, that you have kind of like starter marriages where you know, you pick the person that you want to be the father or mother of your children, and you get through some of those early, you guys look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah, I've heard this, starter marriages, and then, in fact, I've heard clients refer to this. This was for my starter marriage. And, um, and then they realized that the partner that they were, were with is no longer really suited to what they needed for that next stage. Um, whether it was uh, moving into late childhood or early adolescence with their children, and so they would find the suitable partner. Um, and then, you know, it's also possible that later in life, actually, right now, the biggest spike in marital dissolution is the older folks. 
Um, I don't know if you've seen that in the, in the literature um, because the relationship's been devitalized and so it's like, this ain't working, I'm, you know, I'm packing it in. So it, it, I'm just trying, you guys, I know this doesn't necessarily fly well, but I'm trying to get you to think in terms of this lifelong model that is part of our bias, uh, some folks out there say that it's unrealistic um, that to think that you're only going to have one life partner. We're living longer. Um, now granted, a lot of times the person dies. Uh, and so we see that as a little more socially acceptable if the person dies to go out and find somebody. But, um, but you, 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 know, you have that, that notion of a, Timeline. So no, I don't think that there is a way to frame this like what is the best, kind of like the family life cycle, you know, now we're going to frame this so you can maximize having as much of it as you possibly can. Um, uh, although, there probably are examples of it, I mean, the advice that is out there about when a couple marries and when is the best time to have children, how long should you wait, you guys are probably familiar with that, right? Well, actually, the, they say somewhere around two and a half to three and a half years to try to really create that identity as a couple prior to the introduction of children. The argument is the hot romance will be able to stay uh, even through those times when you don't have as much opportunity to feed it or to, to be together that way. Um, so, so maybe there is an instance of an example where there is advice out there uh, when the right time to try to preserve that. Um, as far as the abiding friendship, uh, you end up doing a lot of talk when the kids come along about the logistics of parenting rather than really talking from the heart. Um, I know I will encourage couples to do what I call take the pulse of the relationship. How are we doing? How are we doing, babe? What's up? How are we doing? You know, it's just a way to check in. It's a different way to check in in terms of, uh, you could say hot romance, and I apologize, I use those terms of endearment, you can ask my wife, those are genuine, mm -hmm. uh, uh, some people it's not politically correct anymore. Um, for me and my husband, we're like, okay, we're not necessarily ready to have kids, or even if we want to have them. So I mean, would it, you know, when do you kind of figure out what you consider having it all and if you take away or add to those those four things. But you remember what I said. I said you could only have two right. at any one moment in time. I so mean, even though you're not right. a parent. So I mean it was still play I mean it, it would be a lot easier to obtain the three <laughs> without the <laughs> Well <laughs> Yes. Yes. But but I would even argue that to, and this is where uh, I'm sorry to, to um, I want you to take this the right way. Our culture is not family friendly. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. It is not. Yeah. And, and actually it, it pains me to see the way our culture is comparative to, and I'm not saying we got to be like the Scandinavians or the Germans or anybody mm -hmm. else, but there should be uh, those things in place to provide opportunity for people to strengthen their relationships, be together as a couple. Uh, I don't know what necessarily the answer is. I know I put in my own paperwork, as I envision the future, I think we have to rethink work in our culture. So, so yeah, if it was just no kids in there, mm -hmm. I think the work is still tough. Yeah. There, we're continuing to expect lots and lots of hours for less money in the culture. And, and I'm not anti-business, and I'm not anti-capitalism, but I, the, the culture really does not do family. Uh, and it, it pains me, because a lot of these relationships that find themselves in trouble, they're dancing as fast as they can, spinning those plates, trying to make all that stuff happen, and there's, there's no way to accomplish it without feeling like you failed somebody. So, um, if there's only three without the great parenting, you probably have a greater likelihood of realizing it more 
that you would, including the great parenting as an ideal, but I'm, st I'm still gonna argue that uh, the, car the career is gonna really work at you. It, and I'm assuming it's work career. Uh, we could frame that, like I said, more broadly. It's about making that contribution. I'm here to tell you, you fall in and out of love with your partner over the relationship. How about that one? You fall in and out of love. These things are so demanding that there will come those times when um, life becomes a real challenge. I'll, I'll give you another story. This would be a good one to end on. Working on my doctor. We move out. My wife, three little kids, move out to Southern, Southern California so that I can pursue my dream. I want to get my doctor, USC. And uh, I'm a, a teaching assistant. Teaching assistant, um, I think we have 400 students in the class, right? So there's a whole bunch of TAs, and um, we, we're all working together to be, you know, you had discussion groups, you had to lead, but then you had to grade all these papers, and then as it happened, as time went on, I became the team lead for all the TAs, and I think it had to do with the fact that I was older, and they thought they'd be having somebody a little older would, you know, make that all work. So hey, I'm all happy. Uh, about this. Uh, it's not a bad thing. I mean, they're paying all my tuition. I get a stipend. Uh, that's part of my job responsibility, right? Um, but now my wife, after three months of this, and me being kind of the ghost parent, uh, she's feeling like she's been doing this alone for three months. So, we're getting ready for Christmas break. Um, that's not lost on me. And uh, got the grades all finalized. They're all done. I've turned them in. And this is just when computers are getting going. So it's like you had to have hard copies. Um, you didn't just do it online. So it was, it was labor intensive. It really took a lot of, a lot of work. And I get them all done, um, get them into uh, a professor who will remain nameless and get off the phone and I turned to my wife and I said, we're free, I'm free, let's party, right? It's Christmas, let's have a good time and the kids are yay, daddy, and off we go, right? For about five minutes, five minutes. Ring, the, the guy that's the head professor of the program is on the phone and he has been reviewing them, uh, these final grades. And he says there's too many Fs. I want you to rework the final into a curve based on these numbers and recalculate the 400 grades so we don't have this many Fs. And I'm on the phone. Now my wife is changing our youngest son's diaper. She's on the floor. And occasionally she's looking at me, and I'm sure she can see something is going on. And I turn to her, I put the phone on the receiver, and I said, uh, babe, I gotta redo those exams and those grades. And she used to be a softball pitcher. Okay. So she's in the process of changing the diaper. Okay, now she's balled it up real nice, never looks, backhands it as fast as she could throw it. And it hits me right in the chest. Uh. True story. True story. But it captures, the story captures the challenges about trying to manage all of those demands. And here's, here's a noble thing. She was on board with this. This was a joint decision, me going back for my uh, higher degree. This was something we went into. She was making it an adventure. She did not think that she was going to be a single parent and that I was going to be the ghost parent. 
And actually, in terms of our relationship, as the time went on, that became tougher and tougher. And when we finished and we moved back to Pennsylvania, that's probably the toughest time we had was readjusting because we had fallen out of love with each other. We hadn't put enough time into the relationship the way we should have. But we didn't think that it ended there. And in my mind's eye, I do think our commitment to each other and, and our faith really adds a, an element in here, which is we decided, well, we got to make it more of a priority. Hey, we're on the other side of it. I was almost. I had to do the dissertation from a distance. But that's, a, that's another story. We'll say that. Um, but we, we started to make the, you know, the relationship more of a priority and recognized this was a stage. This was kind of getting through this. You know, that for a time, our relationship couldn't be the priority. Um, and it was tough. I, and I think we both still feel the pain from that time. It's not a good feeling. Uh, but we rediscovered each other. And I would bet we could identify different points. That was probably the toughest. But different points throughout the 40 years we've been married where, you know, we were she might have wanted to put me at the curb. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised because I'm not an angel, that's for sure. But nobody is, right? Okay. 